Okay. Um, thank you. Before um, I get started, um, I'm first of all th very thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to the non-birthday conference. Um, but I would like to say to Anton that uh, um, his contributions um, to the subject are profound uh, and have been for so many, many years, um, have influenced this field tremendously, and um, I'm completely sure that it'll continue into the future. Um, on a more personal level, um, um, working with Anton, collaborating with Anton was, has been one of the great pleasures of my mathematical life and personal life as well. Uh, he taught me so much and it was such a pleasure to work with, and is a pleasure to work with Anton and um, as not only mathematically but personally um, such a generous and uh, very kind person and I've valued my friendship uh, with Anton for, I think it's been over 30 years uh, to get, so um, that I hope will continue as well. Okay, um, so uh, this is joint work with uh, uh, Jada Fathrea and uh, Samantha Fairchild. Um, omega, so omega, omega is gonna be a translation surface. Gosh. Okay, translation surface on a closed surface of genus G, usual, um, and it'll lie in some stratum. I won't write that down. And what I'm interested in is, um, well, let's fix a number A greater than or equal to zero. And I want to count, I want to look at um, on omega, I want to look at and a given number r. I'm interested in saddle connections, pairs of saddle connections on omega. So this is pairs of saddle connections. See, there's our saddle connections. Let me just interrupt what I'm writing um, and draw a familiar picture. Here's our translation surface, um, an octagon with opposite sides identified, a saddle connection. Of course, this has been obviously talked about earlier by Sam. Saddle connection will be a straight line joining two vertices. Um, and I'm interested in pairs of saddle connections um, with the following property, their length. So again, here, there's a holonomy vector and this is, I'm perhaps conflating a saddle connection with, as a geometric object with its length, but I'll, I'll just write it like that. Um, and maybe I'll want, want to have beta less than or equal to r. And here is the major condition that the cross product of a and b is, alpha and beta rather, is less than or equal to this constant A. So what is this? So you think of this as two, a pair of vectors in R2, and then this is just the cross product of those two vectors. So that would be the area, if you were in R2, that's the area of the parallelogram that they span. And um, so um, I want that bounded by A for some fixed A. Now why do we, why have that? Why? If we, if we don't have a condition like this and you're just counting pairs, then there's, that's sort of trivial in a sense because that's just going to be counting each one individually. So this is a condition on the pair of saddle connections. You can think of this as the virtual area of the saddle connections, but they may not, absolutely may not bound a parallelogram. They're, they could cross and so forth, but they're just, thought of as, as vectors. And, um, and so we're interested in counting. And the statement, um, we're interested in counting pairs. I'm gonna give a motivation for this in a minute. Um, the statement, I'll, I'm gonna write down the theorem 
and then give the motivation. The theorem is going to be a statement about almost every um, translation surface, and the measure is the so-called MV measure. Um, <laughs> what I'd like to, <laughs> on a serious note, I'd like to make a remark here that um, uh, the remark I'd like to make is that uh, John Smiley was instrumental in defining this, helping define this measure uh, and proving properties about it. Um, John Smiley. And um, so I'm going to call the measure MVS. Uh, okay. So what's the theorem? Um, the theorem is, um, the theorem is, there, um, there, so we're given an A. There exists a constant C sub A such that for almost every omega with respect to this measure, um, again, I've, uh, at the risk of getting into trouble, I always like to think of it as Lebesgue measure. Um, <laughs> uh, so, okay, for almost every omega, um, if we look at the number of in this of pairs, okay, and we divide by r squared, um, and let r go to infinity. This limit is is exists. n is equal to c sub a. So there is a quadratic asymptotic growth um, for the number of um, uh, the number of pairs. Okay? So I want to give a kind of a loose motivation for the th why we care about pairs. And um, um, so I think the first, for me, the first motivation was in fact a theorem of uh, John Smiley and Barack Weiss. Smiley and Weiss. So uh, the theorem states that if omega happens to be a lattice surface or Veach surface, then there exists and some constant A0, such that um, if two vectors, two saddle connections, um, if their virtual area, or the parallelogram, or um, if, let me just say it this way, if alpha, these are saddle connections, if this is less than or equal to A0, then alpha and beta are parallel. So there is, for small a0, small, sufficiently small a0, you're not virtual, there are no virtual parallelograms that are non-trivial. Um, that's one um, motivation is, okay, what about a general translation surface? Another motivation which um, is that you might look at in SL2Z, you might look at two by, in SL2Z, you're looking at two by two matrices. You may look at two by two matrices where the coefficients or the entries are bounded by some R. So you're really talking about in, because um, it's SL2Z, you're talking about integer vectors with their cross product equal to one, because it's SL2Z, and you might want to count such matrices. It's a, that problem is a little different than this one. Because um, there, um, the, let's say if you require that the sum of the entries be le less than or equal to r, um, maybe, um, let's see, I guess, or maybe if the vectors are, uh, don't have to be less than or equal to r, it's, it's, it's slightly different than this. But anyway, that's a kind of another motivation where pairs come in. Um, and a third one, which is very loose generalization, a very loose connection is like what uh, Sam, Samantha talked about uh, earlier this morning. Um, 
and that is roughly angles between saddle connections. Because if, um, if I have two saddle connections that are very long and they make a um, fixed cross product, the parallelogram is some fixed area and they're very long, then the angle between them is very small. And so it's somehow in some, you know, not completely well-defined way, it's like the problem that uh, was, Sam was talking about this morning of gaps in angles. Okay, now let me also, and I almost forgot, I just, we just learned in the last um, couple of days that, and I hope I uh, pronounce your name correctly, bon, Bonafu, is that correct? Chen. You spell it correctly. Um, he showed the theorem is true for um, every ergodic um, SL2R invariant ergodic measure. Um, the same statement. Of course, the constant CA could, could be very different. Okay. Um, all right, now that sort of maybe motivation, let me, um, let me uh, talk about a little bit of history or maybe another motivation. If you're counting one saddle connection, um, this has been done in, in, in a sense and is maybe is probably familiar to many of you, which is the siegel veach constant. And so let me just, um, let's see here, okay. Is this, whoop, all right, figure this out. Okay. C, CA depends on the stratum. Well, we don't know. I mean, one of the things I'm gonna talk about in in a few minutes is um, why we don't know anything about C sub A by contrast to what we know about when we count a single saddle connection. The siegel veach constant comes in, it can be computed, and so forth, and, and you know, to me an interesting problem here is I have no idea, the C sub A d the, depends on the stratum, I'm pr pretty sure it would, um, but the issue is, you know, how does it depend on A? Um, and what is it? I mean, uh, if, if A is 10, what, what, what is it? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yes it is. Okay, because we yeah, 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 because of course we, we construct a certain function depending on A, and then we run a machinery of, um, we're gonna run a machinery that's maybe familiar to, um, on how to you know, find the, the, um, the uh, uh, show that there's a limit. In a completely responsible level, what do, what do you expect from dependence on C? <laughs> well, I mean, certainly I expect that it should go to infinity as A goes to infinity. Now, that might seem obvious because you're allowing bigger and bigger A and therefore as A gets bigger and bigger, there are fewer and fewer restrictions and as A goes to infinity, there's no, restri no restrictions. But what goes into this is there are a couple of limits that we have to take and so it's, it, the issue could be if you just sort of think, oh, this is trivial, it would, but it amounts to an inter exchange, inter exchange of limits, which is problematic. But I, I mean, I think it should certainly should go to infinity. Whether it's continuous, I, uh, I have no idea, actually. It's less than linear in the beach. In the beach case, we have an upper bound that's. Oh, okay. Okay, let me, let me talk a little bit about history. Um, let's see here, okay. So for a single saddle connection, 
Um, so for a single saddle connection, um, so, uh, so we're just counting saddle connections. So um, uh, work of uh, Alex and Eskin and myself, uh, for each stratum, again, it's the C here will depend on the stratum, um, the number of, um, if I look at the number of saddle connections of length less than or equal to R, that is asymptotic to C R squared uh, for almost all, for almost all omega. And actually this is true for any ergodic measure. Um, and then this was improved upon by, in this famous paper of Eskin, Merzakhani. Uh, oh gosh, I'm going to misspell her name. That's terrible. Merzakhani Mohammadi. where they got a, um, a statement for every translation surface. So the statement is for all omega, there is this a constant C. Now it's not quite point-wise converging like that. It's converging on average. Limit as t goes to infinity of the integral 0 to t. The number of saddle connections of length e to the s. Um, you, you multiply by e to the minus 2s, so here's the sort of a number r, here's 1 over r squared, and you um, integrated this with respect to s from 0 to t, um, that this ha has a limit. Um, is there 1 over t up front? Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so this is sort of uh, counting on average, okay? Now, let me explain, try to, get, again, historically, what the difference between this single saddle connection and sort of talk about the siegel veach constant. So um, maybe I'll erase this. And talk about what veach did, so this is, Again, quite a few years ago, but this was kind of, um, I would say, that paper of Veach and um, together with the uh, uh, work in, of Eskin, Margulis Moses in, um, in the Oppenheim problem sort of motivated everything in, in this sense, in the counting. Um, so, okay, so let's, this is Siegel Veach. Um, formula. Okay, so you're, suppose you're given a continuous function of compact support on R2 um, and you define f hat from your stratum, so I'm going to just call without labeling what the stratum is, to the reals and the for, the, you define, so I'm making a definition, f hat of any omega is you count, you look at all um, vectors that appear as saddle connections. So I'm using v for saddle connection. You will evaluate f at those vectors, and that's f hat. And then, so this f hat is the way, because every, there's this SL2R action everywhere, f hat is, um, f hat is SL2R equivariant. And Veach observed that these facts say, so we also proved that f hat is in L1 of the stratum, okay? Um, and uh, uh, Veach um, used that to say that actually the integral of f hat 
so this is the Siegel-Veach formula, um, is a constant, so there, ex there exists a constant, there exists a constant so that um, the integral of uh, f hat over the stratum is the integral of f over r2 with respect to Lebesgue. So this is Lebesgue. And this is an honest Lebesgue. <laughs> okay. There is a, um, a, an atomic um, possibility here which goes away for this particular problem. So this is a very general statement uh, about SL2R invariant linear functionals, equivariant linear functionals on, on, uh, on, a, on a space. Okay, and so C, C is called the Siegel-Veach constant. And the point about this is that you can use, um, so this is true for any F of uh, compact support, and you could take particular Fs, special Fs, for example, F would, could be the characteristic function in R2 of a ball of radius epsilon, ball of radius epsilon centered at the origin where epsilon can go to zero. And um, this is just pi, r, pi epsilon squared. This is really going to be one at each point in the stratum. And so you can use this um, to evaluate C And this looks like some combinatorial constant. And then there is a volume of a stratum that you have pinched your curve along divided by the volume of the stratum that you started in. And um, this is an example of uh, work that uh, um, with, with uh, Anton and uh, Alex Eskin. So um, this is Anton introduced me to all of this. Um, okay, that's what happens, and, and okay, and then of course there's been a, um, a great deal of work, as we just heard some of it, but a great, you know, in evaluating these volumes, and so one can get explicit um, values for the Siegel-Veach constant. Okay, now what goes, what happens in our case? And uh, in our case, Things are, now we're going to have a function, because we're talking about pairs, we're going to be given a function h, which is not defined on R2, but on R4, pairs of vectors, or on C2, if you like. h is going to go, say, a continuous function on C cross C to the reals. And um, we're going to similarly, we define h hat at any omega is f of h evaluated at a pair, v or let's say z w. Okay, where z and w, this is going to be the, sorry, this is going to be the sum, I hope I wrote sum, yeah, there's sum over there. This is the sum over z and w, a pair of saddle connections. So there's a pair of saddle connections. This is their holonomy vectors. We evaluate H on the pair. Because H has compact support, this is a finite sum as it was over there. And you get a Siegel-Veach. Um, so, okay, so the first issue is why is H hat in L1? So that was an important fact over here. Now we're talking about pairs, so it's not, doesn't follow from that, but um, a, whoop. Okay. Okay, so, oh, let me raise this on the board, whoop. Oh, I'm still, all right. Okay, so here, for the Siegel-Veach formula, we needed uh, f in L, f hat in L1. 
uh, H is hat is defined on pairs. And so what we need here is that the original F is better, in some sense better, than being in L1. It's F hat is, it, that F hat is in, whoops, in L2 um, of the measure. And then that imp will imply that H hat is in L1. That will allow us to kind of run the, the Siegel Veach machinery to get a measure. Now, um, this was proven a few, few years ago by, again, by uh, uh, JDF. Um, Yitwa Chung and myself, uh, the statement that F, is, F hat is an L2. And possibly a motivation here was what may be an application of that, and so this is sort of an application. Now, what um, H. Chen evidently, you know, ha well, what, what he has done is that he has extended the statement for the MVS measure to an arbitrary ergodic measure. So, did I spell it correctly? Yeah, okay. This is also true for, um, all, is true for all ergodic measures, not just Lebesgue. Okay, and um, that is, allows kind of a machinery to go through. Once it becomes L2, then pairs become L1, and you can kind of run the machinery. Okay, so now what do you get out of this just because it's L1? Well, you can do the same thing. You can take a function h, and you can um, map it to h hat, and this is a linear functional on to L1, L1 linear functional, and you get that H hat similar to Siegel Veach, but now the complication, I perhaps didn't say it the way I should have. In the Siegel Veach formula up there, you're, what you're using is that the only SL2R invariant measures on the plane are Lebesgue measure and an atomic measure and which you sort of rule out. And, or I should say, multiple of Lebesgue. And that's where that formula comes from. C integral of F d lambda, because the, of a, of a uh, classification of ergodic uh, SL2R invariant measures. Um, but now we're in R4, and in R4 we get a SL2R invariant measure here we go. We get an SL2R invariant measure in the same way, but now they're more complicated. And so here is the statement. This implies the fact that this is a bounded linear, a linear functional, says that the integral of H hat um, is the integral of H dm on, on C2 for some measure m for some SL2R invariant measure M. Yes, and the, the, so thank you. The action on, R, on C2 or on R2 cross R2 is the diagonal action. Thank you, yeah. And, but these can be more, there's, there are more of them than just somehow Lebesgue, and so, the, uh, let me write it over here. Here's what one can say about M, and it's in some sense not very much. Um, or maybe it's, okay. So the integral of H dm on C cross C can be written as this is the, there, I should say, there exists a pair of measures nu and uh, what notation rho, not measure, sorry, functions of one variable, nu and rho, so that 
the measure h, this is m, it can be, ri is, can, is be written as, um, okay, let me just write it down. Okay, and just T, Z, W, D lambda, Z, W, and then um, D nu of T. And there's a, this is, gives an atomic, kind of an atomic measure. Let me just write it down and then just say what these sentences are. So this is over the um, P1 integral over C, H of S, SZ, uh, DZ, and then uh, D rho. Okay, let me, you know, break this down. What in the world are we getting here? So T is, there's going to be a, f a function or a measure nu of T. So T is running through the non-negative, uh, non, uh, I think this is plus, maybe I need, no, I think, it, no, it's all of R, not just the uh, plus. Okay, here, so for each T, we look at H evaluated at TZW, and then this, I should say, lambda here, sorry, lambda is har measure, lambda is har measure, on SL2R. Okay, so what we think of is that Z and W are in SL2R, so they have determinant one. So we're looking at a Z and a W in SL2R, Z pair of vectors in SL2R. We're multiplying, we're scaling the first vector by some T, evaluating the function H on that pair for each t with respect to har measure, and then integrating over t with respect to some unknown nu. The second term is when um, the two variables are scalar multiples of each other. Here's a z. Uh, that should be a z here. There's a z. And then the second term is a scalar multiple, a real scalar multiple. So they, of course, they have, of course, have determinant zero, integrated dz over the complex numbers, and then there's some unknown row. Now, I think in our case, this disappears. There's, uh, because this is, you're somehow looking at saddle, except in the lattice surface case, you're looking at pairs of saddle connections that are parallel. And this term will disappear, but here is the Siegel-Veach formula, um, and that's HDM, and that's supposed to be our constant H hat, the, the constant C sub A. And we, I, we do not know how to compute this. Okay. Okay, so that's sort of the um, bad news, and, or to me, the interesting thing is how might you try to compute or say something about um, this. This is I, sh I should say this is the constant C sub a. Okay, given by the Siegel-Veach formula. But how do you find it? Okay, let me spend um, uh, a little bit of sort of trying to say what is the main idea of what's going on here. No, are there, if there are questions? You're going to tell us which function H. Yeah, I'm now going to, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, is now tr uh, tell, uh, tell you what a function H is that I'm going to look for. Yeah. No, yeah, no, so I cannot. Right. Um, I would like to, so in the, in the one saddle connection case, what I was, this work, you know, is that you express the constant in terms of the principal boundary, the volume of what you get when you 
pinch the curve, and so forth. Now we have a, here's the problem in a sense. If you try to do the same thing and say, oh, okay, let's take a function h, which is small, you're near the boundary, and one saddle connection is really short. The other saddle connection, because the cross product is allowed to be some number a, the other vector will be really, can be really long. And I don't like long vectors near the principal boundary. Um, maybe somebody else does like them, but um, I, I, I just could not think about how to find, how to make any computation in terms of the principal boundary and volumes. Okay, but again, that doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, okay. Okay, so let me kind of talk about the kind of main step here. Well, if one, okay. So let's just set up, first of all, a little bit of notation. Um, this is the set of, this is the kind of thing that we're looking at. ZW, let's say, absolute value of Z less than R, bigger than R over 2. W is, say, less than Z, and their cross product is less than A. Okay, so we're kind of in, that's a set in R4. We could look, for example, at the characteristic function, and I'm going to replace r with e to the t. So that's the indicator function. And the count that we're interested in is, I'll put an a for the subscript, put a star here to indicate that I'm counting, and that is um, is the hat function. Namely, you're counting the hat function for um, dA of e to the t. So in other words, the hat means count. So this is the number that we're interested in, and as r goes to infinity. OK. And here is, um, maybe I'll write it over here. Here is a statement that, um, is reminiscent of the kind of thing that I think first appeared in the work of Eskin Margulis Moses in the Oppenheim, and then we had a similar kind of statement, Eskin and Alex Eskin and myself, and then it's also been used, this kind of statement, in a recent paper of Nouveau or Weiss, um, but it's this kind of statement. We want to build a function h sub a, from, let's say, C2 to R. So this is the goal. So that this counting, omega e to the ta, the thing we care about, divided by e to the 2t, okay, so that's the R, that is approximately, I'm going to subtract, 0 to 2 pi h hat along g t r theta omega d, t, d theta. And that this difference, I'll explain what this is in a second, this difference should go to zero. Uh, it's going to, we're, we're, the goal is to build a function with it. This is the goal. OK, this is the goal. This is the kind of thing we're interested This is the quantity we're interested. What's this? So GT is the Teichmuller flow. e to the t 0, e to the minus t 0. So we're rotating our omega and flowing time t. t. So we're looking at a circle of radius, we're looking at the average, so 
what this is is the average of our function, h hat. Here's our origin, so to speak, and we're integrating along a um, circle of radius e to the t, or I guess log. There should, should be a log in there, so there's a t circle of radius t. We're integrating, um, we're flowing time t in different directions, and we're counting the number, at each point on that circle, we're counting the number of saddle connections um, whose value is going to be in some fixed, whose value is taken on by this function h sub a, and that this difference should be closer and closer to the quantity we want as t goes to infinity. This is t goes to infinity. Okay. Suppose we can do that, that's the goal. Um, so this is again, as I say, some kind of, you know, this is not some new technique in a sense, um, but it's in a different s scenario from before. And if this is true, so such that, if this can be done, then, so if the goal, if that goal is, if the goal is achieved, then we can apply a theorem of Nouveau. Amos Nouveau, which says that the right-hand side has a limit. Okay, so the Nouveau's theorem says, in general, you have some function h hat, some function defined on your space, your SL2R invariant, your measure SL2R invariant. You integrate over larger and larger circles. Nouveau's theorem says that for almost every omega, um, the right-hand side converges to, in fact, to the integral of h hat. H, h a hat on the stratum. Okay, now actually one needs a little bit more than L1. You actually, to apply Nouveau's theorem, you need your h hat to be better, a little better than h L1. It has to be L1 plus something, L1 plus delta, and actually, uh, JDEF yet one, I showed that this, in this previous paper, and I believe that H, HN has shown the similar statement for uh, an arbitrary ergodic invariant measure, that the H hat is even better than L1. Okay, so that's the goal. So is to find some H, some HA with this property. Okay, so I'm maybe in the interest of time, I will just draw a picture or give a, tell us what, tell you what a H, my H A is. Okay, so there's a picture up there, but I'm not quite ready for it. So, um, let me lower. Whoop. Okay, so I, do I have, well, seven minutes or something? No, you have, you have, it's 12 or 5. 12 or 5. that may be too much time. <laughs> Okay, all right, okay. Twelve, okay. So, um, much of the work, as I say, this was much of the work in this paper. Now, to apply Nouveau's theorem, if you look at it carefully, Nouveau says, oh, your, your function can't just be an L1, plus. It, has, it has to be what's called a K-finite function. So it's like, it has to be like a trigonometric function, and our function that I build is not trigonometric. So there's, some, there's certainly some things to do there, but that's the basic uh, idea, is to build such a function. And let me just uh, hopefully draw a couple of pictures to suggest what is involved. Okay, so let me do the following. For each, um, for each, so suppose I have a subset of R2, or say a subset of the complex plane. So S is some subset of the complex plane. For each Z 
in S, um, I'm going to look at a parallelogram. So this is going to be a set of Ws. So these are vectors, um, a set of Ws in the complex plane. So that W um, wedge product with Z is less than or equal to A, the kind of thing we want. And the imaginary part of W, so I'm thinking the complex numbers, I'm taking their imaginary part. Uh, the imaginary part of W is less than or equal to the imaginary part of Z. Okay, so this is supposed to be a picture of that. Um, oh, maybe I should say one, um, I, I don't know if I, let me maybe say one other definition here. DA of Z is the set of Ws such that W is less than or equal to Z, and W is less than the. So D is the kind of set that we really care about. It's vectors which are W is less than Z, and the cross product is less than A. And this is sort of a weird condition. It's a condition on the imaginary parts of one is less than or equal to the imaginary part of the other. I'll explain in a second why in the world we do this. There is a picture. Um, so that's a disk of radius z in, let's see here. Whoop. This is a, di here's the origin. This is a disk of radius z. So z is given to me. And I have two parallel lines in, I guess the color is light blue. Um, and I have two parallel lines. And the, this set is all Ws inside the circle bounded by these two parallel lines. So it's everything inside the circle bounded by these two parallel lines. That's DA. PA is the parallelogram inside the part of the parallelogram inside the circle. So it, it's sorry, it doesn't have to be inside the circle. It's a statement about the imaginary parts. So here the imaginary part is fixed of W, and here I didn't draw it very well, but there's another imaginary part is fixed. So the second set the, is literally this parallelogram bounded by two parallel lines and two horizontal lines. Maybe it's just because those lines are parallel to Z, right, in this picture, right? Because Z is the middle of the, is, is kind of the middle of the parallelogram. Z, Z is the middle of the parallelogram, yeah. OK. And now they're not quite the same set, because there's an imaginary part that one is less than, and the other one is the imaginary part. So the difference of these two sets are kind of, I've you know, there's a little piece here and a little piece there, and then there's a corresponding piece down there. So those two sets differ by a little bit. They're not the same. And now, that's for each z. Now, suppose I have s as a, um, suppose, okay, so s is some subset. I w suppose I do that for every z in s, and now I'm going to build a new set which I'm going to call, um, let's see, I'm going to call P A of S is the set, of, is the union over all Z's in my set S of P A of Z. So I'm going to have some subset of the plane, and over each point in that subset of the plane, I'm going to have a parallelogram. So it's a sub, this is a subset of R4. It's a kind of a fibered set in R4. Okay, over each point, I have a kind of a different parallelogram. Now, why in the world did we use parallelograms as opposed to the original circle? So this is a familiar issue, and that's because parallelograms work much better for the GT flow. Because the GT flow doesn't preserve lengths but it preserves inequalities on the imaginary part and the real part. So that's why GT of a parallelogram 
is better behaved than GT of a circle. And actually, Sam, I think, already talked about that idea this morning, earlier, that you know, circles are not so good, so you want to approximate them by something that's better for the GT action. And so the statement is that the parallelogram of GT of the parallelogram over a set S is the parallelogram over GT of S. Okay, so that's why somehow parallelograms work well with this geodesic flow, the Teichmuller flow. Okay, and now finally I got to tell you what HA is. I have to have a very special S that I care about. And S will be, this is a general S. I'm going to take a trapezoid. Let's see, let me write the trapezoid. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm going to take a trapezoid. This is y equals a half. This is the line y equals 1. This is y equals x. And this is y equals minus x. And here's the origin. But that's not in the set. This is a trapezoid. I'll just write it as TRP. And I'm going to take that as a particular example of S. And so, fine, so I'm going to have a trapezoid in the plane. And over each point in that trapezoid, I'm going to have this parallelogram. And finally, this HA is the characteristic function of the set PA of S, where S is a trapezoid. That's my function H. Okay, and what we do with this function, and I will now just write down two quick formulas, two ideas here, and, and, then, and then stop. Um, the first is, the, this trapezoid is really close to being the set that we cared about. Okay, it was just, there was, oh, I erased the picture, there was just some little pieces that were different. They're, they're not, it wasn't exactly the set that we, that we were w working with, but it's close. And so here is a, um, a statement. If we average our function h sub a, over, there's nothing about saddle connections here. So we take any z and w. In z and w are vectors in C2, C, C, in C, so the pairs in C2. If we average, we take this, rotate the vector, apply, Teichmuller, apply the, I shouldn't say Teichmuller here, this is just the 2 by 2 matrix, e to the t 0, 0, e to the minus t. So this, this, there's no moduli space here. This is just in, R, in C cross C. Um, that this is approximately e to the minus 2t over pi, the characteristic function of d. Approximately meaning the difference is really small. So this is a statement really from about that picture. I had these two regions or four regions where things were a little different and I'm just sort of measuring how different they are when, we into, when we're on a circle. Okay, now what you want to do is, this is true for every z, w, in c, in each in c. I want to add, now I want to go to the translation surface. So what I want to do is I want to take this estimate, this is really close to that, and I want to add it up over all possible z, w that are holonomy vectors of saddle connections. So I want to, for each z and w pair in of saddle connections, 
for each pair of saddle connections, I want to take this formula and add it up over all of this. Okay, so I want to add this inequality. So for each one, it's very close, but I'm adding. So maybe the error term becomes big. And, but I don't want it to be big, I want it to look like that. And so, in some sense, this is kind of where the work is, is that there are not, we look at the places where ZW is where we really differ from the characteristic function. The, we look at the error term here, and that corresponds to some Z and W which have some property with respect to each other. Maybe the, maybe the imaginary parts are just a little bit, one is bigger than the other, so we don't, we're not in the right place. We want to know that there are not too many saddle connections that have that property. So to go from here to star, or to, to go from, to go from double star to what we want up above, we have to look at different parts of the stratum that may have very small volume and say, oh, there are not so many saddle connections in those sets. Or we might have to be in the thick part of the stratum and we're looking for pairs of saddle connections that are kind of close to each other in some way, that maybe their imaginary parts are almost the same. Or, so there are different parts of the stratum that we have to estimate either the volume of the stratum, of that part of the stratum, or, um, or uh, estimate the, part, the, the volume of that part of the stratum, or um, estimate how many saddle connections there can be in there. And so that's, there's you know, a bunch of stuff known uh, about estimates in the, in the stratum. And, and one of the things that HN has done is say, okay, these are the estimates we need. And he's also able to do this, get the same kind of estimates for any er ergodic invariant measure. And he uses the, um, multi-scale um, compactification of our, our five authors. Um, part of that was already done, for example, by Ben Dozier, and I should mention that. One of the things that we need here is if you have two short saddle connections of length epsilon and delta, um, so you're really in the thin part, two short saddle, not non-homologous, then the volume is at most something, a constant epsilon squared delta squared. So that's an inequality that uh, um, kind that we need. You're, if you're in the very thin part, uh, the volume is small. That was actually an estimate that uh, John Smiley and I got uh, a number of years ago. Um, that's something that Ben Dozier has recently achieved for any ergodic measure, again, using this multi-scale um, compactification, so it's kind of those kinds of estimates that one needs to go from this statement to the one above. And I'm done.